At the end of April, the federal rule to delist wolves went into effect. There was between the time the wolf rule went into effect in late April and the time they were put back on the rule this summer, one wolf a day being killed in the Northern Rockies region. We don't need no stinking wolves. That's a quote from our governor, the highest politician in the state. It's an embarrassment to the rest of us who care about all wildlife. I'm Janet Barwick, and I work for the Natural Resources Defense Council as a wildlife advocate in Livingston, Montana. Millions of people journey to Yellowstone National Park every year to experience this unique American treasure. The greater Yellowstone ecosystem is full of wildlife that has been here since the time of Lewis and Clark. But no wildlife species has sparked controversy like the North American gray wolf. And as a last-ditch effort, the Bush administration has made plans to delist wolves once again, even after a federal judge deemed the state plans as inadequate to protect the species. We decided that this controversy was not going to go away based on litigation and court cases, and we wanted to go out and really discover what solutions could be found to allow humans and wolves to coexist on the landscape. Louisa Wilcox is my friend and mentor, and she lives with her husband and two dogs in Livingston. She's been advocating for the protection of large carnivores for the last 20 years. I think one of the reasons we're so afraid of wolves is that we're afraid of part of our own wild nature. In order to find real solutions, we need to speak to people who deal with wolves on a regular basis. Jim Powers works with Keystone Conservation as a range rider program that puts human presence on the landscape with cattle to create an adversive condition for wolves. If they're living on the elk and the deer, that's great. That's, that was their purpose. When they go to living on the cattle, it's, it's a different tool. That, that, that is somebody's living. I know one loss in a, in, in a guy's herd is, is one too many. Right. But to lose three... That's a lot of money. Franz Kamenzind is a wildlife biologist who specializes in wolves and coyotes. There's no question that there are some ranchers that are having a hard time with wolves on their, on their either their allotment on public land or in some cases even on their private land. I think some of the grazing permittees are going to have to change their operations and adapt. And, and that's not easy. None of us like to do that. When we first came here four years ago, you could sit here, look over in this country, and you'd see two to three hundred head of elk. We're, we're not seeing that anymore. You know, I, I love to hunt. I, lo I like the outdoors. I love watching the elk and stuff. There's got to be a medium set in there someplace. This seemed like a very serious concern for Jim and a lot of other people. Are wolves, in fact, having a negative impact on game species? The distribution of elk is a little different now. Uh, there are fewer. Again, I, I'm not going to deny that. But here, where we're sitting right now in Jackson Hole, this Jackson Hole elk herd has been above objective, which is the game and fish's preferred number, population level, has been up above objective now, I think, for almost 20 years. And we have had wolves here since 1997. So they have not even come close to knocking this herd down. Because wolves and elk and deer have co-evolved over thousands of years. So there is a balance that they create and maintain. The wolf population can never get so big that all the elk are gone, or they too would be gone. I guess it gets back to the question of, can we have wolves? Can we have wolves here? And what is the greater benefit? Yellowstone's benefited in a lot of interesting and subtle ways. The rejuvenation of streamside vegetation, willows and aspen in particular, that had been overbrowsed by elk. So what wolves did was they started moving elk across the landscape, which was very, very helpful for songbird populations, for the fisheries, uh, beavers, and other species. Um, you had a decline in coyote populations uh, in certain parts of the park and outside the park. And that actually benefited species like pronghorn antelope, because coyotes are one of the major predators on baby pronghorn. So there's many different ways that wolves, by being restored in the ecosystem, have helped other species. Meredith and Tori Taylor have run an outfitting and guide service in Dubois, Wyoming for the last 20 years. 
Both of them have spent their lives advocating for the protection of wildlife species. Wolves don't decimate other species. They're fairly easy to live among, and they actually have had less depredation of livestock than was originally anticipated in the environmental impact statement that was written in the 1980s. In my mind, I think even the folks that don't like wolves, many of them would accept the fact that they're here and let's deal with them, let's get a plan that's legal and so that we can move on. However, I think there's a small group of very vocal people that hate wolves and they're unfortunately have the ear of a lot of our politicians. The state of Wyoming has passed a law that creates 90% of the state or thereabouts as a predator shoot on site zone that is unacceptable. The, the ranchers in the state of Wyoming should be pushing their legislators to change that law. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did the right thing. Actually, it was Judge Malloy who told the Fish and Wildlife Service to send that, that plan back to Wyoming and tell them that they have to come up with a viable plan, such as have trophy games statewide, and then the wolves will be able to be managed just as any other wildlife species. There'll be a number of licenses, there'll be a hunting season, and you won't have this uh, declaration of war. I think they, they ought to uh, put them on a, you know, a deal like they do a lion, sell that, sell that tag over the counter. Personally, I could never kill a wolf, but there are people that would do that, and there are people who would pay to do that, and if it's done in a regulated manner, that's a concession I can put up with. We would like to see wolves under state control, but only when that control will perpetuate wolves. A fundamental ingredient to successful recovery is a different kind of public process. The public process that was used last time was bankrupt, it was cynical, it ignored everyone in the process. The government, state or federal, didn't care what people thought. And we have to create a level playing field and a real dialogue that says, wolves are gonna be on the landscape, wolves are here to stay. We're gonna have problems, but how do we develop a framework to at least reduce the level of problems and sustain recovery? With 1,500 wolves in the landscape, we're close to what experts believe is true recovery at 2,000 wolves. We're close to recovery. It seems the wolf will always be in a sort of limbo, stuck between its historic bad image and its important role in the ecosystem. Ranchers, conservationists, and sportsmen are gonna have to come together and have an honest dialogue about our values and needs. Understanding that until wolves have met scientifically based recovery goals, they must remain under the protection of the endangered species list.